This is the DLR Cast, the essential podcast for fans of Diamond David Lee Roth. All right, welcome to the DLR Cast, your essential podcast by and for fans of the mighty one, the mighty Diamond David Lee Roth. As always, I'm Steve, along with my good friend Darren Paltrowitz. Hello, Darren. Hey now, we're, we're we're still allowed to say that, right? Yep, still allowed. So I've yet to get a cease and desist. So, um, <laughs> so so let's start with some real quick good news. Uh, for, and that is, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Player FM. Uh, who am I? Am I forgetting anybody else? Podbean, of course. For just do a search at podbean.com, and uh, I think the bulk of your uh, iTunes, your bulk of your podcast, Podchaser, Podcast. Cast addict, uh, Stitcher. I think we're Stitcher too. Yep, we're Stitcher, and thanks to you, we're up at YouTube as well. Wow. I mean, distribution is everything, right? There you go. So we got a great interview today. Before we get to that, if you're new to the podcast, be sure to go back and check out our previous couple episodes because uh, we've got uh, a, we did a fun interview with a band called Limousine Beach, which was the episode before th- before that, and. Uh, our interviews, we're talking Dave and always end up in some different places as well. So who do we have on tap today? This is Linus Dotson or Linus of Hollywood or just Linus. A lot of people know him by different names. He first came onto my radar in the late 90s. He was a singer of a major label band called Size 14, had a bunch of songs and movies. Then he was a solo artist and Puff Daddy's rock remix guy. Not kidding. Uh, co-wrote a bunch of hits for Bowling for Soup. A lot of other artists. He's in Nerf Herder. He scored that Nickelodeon show, School of Rock. It's more like, what doesn't this guy do? Yeah, I had a lot of fun talking with this guy. He's tremendously talented. Uh, check out his check out his music, especially if you're a fan of of all things rock and what he's got going on. What he what he what, he's just I've got a new appreciation for this guy's music, and he was a hell of a lot of fun to talk to. Yeah, I started off with a compliment, which, you know, I've been known to do in some of my interviews. But I got to say, one of my favorite songwriters of the last 20 ish years is is this guy. He can make funny music. He can make sad music. He can make technically impressive music. Oh, yeah. He was in Paul Gilbert from Mr. Big's band, Roger Manning Jr. from Jellyfish's band. Wow. So many credits. Yeah, he has done a lot. So so without further ado, check out our interview with. Linus of Hollywood, and uh, thanks for downloading and listening. And uh, yeah, we'll have more good interviews coming up and talking Dave, uh, uh, <laughs> talking Dave all the time in the episodes ahead. Nothing but yeah. <laughs> Do you mind if we we jump straight into it, Linus? And I start by complimenting you. Yeah, please. I always like that. Okay. <laughs> so starting off with a compliment here. There's three kind of Linuses that I know, musically speaking, from knowing you and about you 20-ish years now. There's the guy who writes funny songs, usually the pop punk, pop metal variety. There's Mm -hmm. the guy who does the serious singer, songwriter kind of thing. And then there's the guy who shreds. And (laughs) you do all those things really well. And I'm not sure that everybody knows that you have shred potential. Now, what was the gateway band to shredding? Was it Judas Priest or was it Van Halen? Uh, let's see. I would say, I would say Judas Priest was a huge, uh, gateway just for like learning riffs and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but, but Van Halen, I think Van Halen 2 was the album that a friend turned me on to when I was, I had just moved to Florida and I think I was probably like 10 or 11 years old or something. And and that was sort of the album that made me decide this is what I want to do with my life. So I was I was really into academics and I wanted to be a chemist or an architect or something like that. And then uh, and then when I heard Van Halen too, I was like, oh, I want to do this. <laughs> so Van Halen ruined my life. <laughs> and was that in real time or was that a couple of years after Van Halen two came out? Uh, I probably I think I moved to Florida in like 1984. So yeah, this definitely was like years years after. Uh, because I think that album came out, what, in 78 or 79? I think it was 79. Steve, you're the statistician. Yeah, Yeah, I think it was 79 also. So, yeah, they did so much in a real compressed amount of time between, what, 78 and 81 or so, so. Yeah, totally. Have you ever heard those, uh, there's like a bootleg, it's called Van Halen 77, and it has like 
their, their recordings that they did before Van Halen won. And it's really interesting to hear. First of all, Michael Anthony's like shredding on the whole thing, like, to, like way more than he does on the Van Halen albums. Um, and then also they have like chunks of songs that would appear on later albums. Like, you know, the song, uh, I'm taking whiskey to the potty tonight and I'm looking for somebody to squeeze. That, yeah. that's, like, that's like the verse of a song on these demos. It's almost like they went back, like when they needed material, they went back to their early demos and kind of just like took chunks of them and like pieced them all together. It's really fascinating actually, because you're listening to it and you're like, wait a minute, that's the chorus from that song. And, yeah, I've I, I've heard that I've heard that stuff, and Darren and I have talked about this before. I don't know the percentage, but I would say it's upwards about eighty percent of all of Van Halen's recorded, written music was at least started, or the foundations for all those songs are written somewhere between like seventy six and seventy eight, give or take. I mean, because I mean, even, even that last Van Halen studio record in twenty twelve, I mean, they went back and reworked some songs that were on original demo tapes, and and uh, I mean. It reportedly, Eddie's always writing, they're always jamming, but so much came out of this one time period that was yeah, obviously incredibly fertile. It's fascinating. And especially when you consider that a lot of those albums, the David Lee Roth albums, you know, like they're kind of short and there's always like a couple covers. So really there's only like, like Diver Down, for instance, is like, I feel like half that record is covers and it's like, it's about 28 minutes long. And it's, it's just like they had to throw yeah. out whether they, <laughs> they figured out how to do it. Exactly. So was your fandom of Van Halen inclusive of David Lee Roth's solo career the whole time, or is it that you got into him after the fact? Um, well, I definitely hopped on board when David Lee Roth was the singer. And then, of course, I was an MTV kid. So uh, so I remember when he did the EP and, and all that. And and then, of course, Van Halen turned into Sammy, Sammy Hagar Van Halen. And I, I actually think at the time, when 5150 came out and uh, Eat Him and Smile came out, I think I was leaning more towards the Sammy Hagar Van Halen because I just love, I loved like songs. And I was like, oh, this is cool because it's like they're writing like actual songs because, you know, technically speaking, Sammy Hagar is a better singer. And, and uh, but as time went by, I realized that the David Lee Roth era was the cool, <laughs> the cooler era. And that David Lee Roth, he doesn't, he doesn't really get a lot of credit for his singing, but he has such a unique voice. He actually really is a great singer. It's so, it's so identifiable. No one else sounds like him. And he just added so much personality. Even the stuff he did like in between the, in between the vocals was so great, all his little noises and stuff. And, <laughs> I mean, there's definitely no, no one like him and there never will be again. Even, even he's not like him now. <laughs> yeah. It, it, you know, it's funny, and I love your perspective as a songwriter and working with singers and stuff. I mean, we talk about this a lot, uh, and we're not haters here. I mean, we just happen to have such a great preference for for Dave. I mean, there's plenty of Sammy stuff that I that I love, you know, that they've done, that they did over the years. But for me, with Dave, it was always he, and I think it's clearly evident, but I'd love to get your take as a songwriter as far as what we may have added to the mix, being not really a true musician. Uh, you know, proficient on any instrument besides obviously his voice, but you know, he to me he always brought the soul and the and the R and B influence to the band. There was just more horsepower to the songs with Eddie. I mean, if you look back at the songs they covered back in the days, I mean, they were doing ZZ Top and R and B stuff and Cool and the Gang, and I think that really informed, you know, what ultimately would have been a, a trio that probably would have preferred to do you know Led Zeppelin and Rush covers before they became the Van Halen that we know of. I mean. I, is is it that evident or is that kind of just my imagination? Oh, no, you're, you're totally right. I mean, I mean, I, I, I feel like they probably kind of wrote the music around whatever singer they had, you know, because the, the Sammy Hagar stuff is so melodic and so traditional in a lot of ways as far as like a, a pop hit song, you know what I mean? Whereas the, the David Lee Roth Van Halen songs were so riff oriented and yeah, definitely had more of an R&B feel, kind of, kind of a more on the blues scale because he that's that's what his whole vibe was it's a little more little yeah. more blues and a little more boozy boozy bop <laughs> <laughs> exactly i was just gonna say there's a, there's was always a swing to it right i mean it was there's a reason why dave does all those dance moves because you can actually dance to you know in an odd way sometimes <laughs> depending on your oh, pedigree yeah. well, but you can dance to a lot of those songs i wonder how much partying he actually did back in the day because i saw like a video of him like you know, this is probably like 
81 or 82 or something and he's doing all this like crazy martial arts and he's just like totally shredded like really in shape like to the point where like there's no way he just magically it's not like he was like doing cocaine every night and all of a sudden has like like 12 pack of abs like I, I always just wonder like how much of that was like you know uh you know i call it i call it perpetuating the party there's a lot of artists who don't actually party but they like do the party thing you know like adrian right. is one buff daddy right. is one like they don't actually party that much but they get everyone else to party <laughs> you know what I mean? like yeah. how do you get singing rock and roll all night and party every day and then not really drinking but having kiss wine on the market kind of like that I, exactly yeah totally that's a good example too yeah, how do you stay in that kind of shape? Do martial arts train with, uh, you know, with, with kickboxing champions, have a six six pack abs, you, you know, you, yeah. and, and not look completely like Keith Richards if you're doing that much, you know. Although the stories are kind of legendary when they're on tour. There's the infamous, uh, it was recounted in, uh, I can't remember which was it, Noel Monk's book that came out last year, whatever, their former manager, where they yeah. went on about, you know, him and, him and, uh, Dave and Ozzy basically decided to see how much blow they can do within like a 48 hour time period and no one could find Ozzy for the gig, you know? So, I mean, I'm sure he wrote it really hard, but you have to have the, some discipline to be able to keep yourself that mentally and physically sharp, no doubt. Yeah, totally. Maybe he just like did a bunch of blow and then started working out and doing his kick, kick, uh, his kick <laughs> regimen or something. Yeah. He's like, and he's like, <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, for God's sakes, my, you know, I I felt completely shit the first three months I went away to college. So I mean, you know, <laughs> I can't believe you could keep that up for year year after year. You know? Yeah, it's really it's really quite amazing. But he he definitely did he did a lot of blow. That's for sure. <laughs> and speaking of blow, the album Sonrisa Salvaje. Are you a fan? Do you own it? What's your deal? I have never even heard it. Do you know what we're talking about here? No, I don't actually. It's the <laughs> human smile recorded in Spanish. Oh, you know what? I, I actually, I think I own that. <laughs> I, I think no, I think I own it. That's one that has Yankee Rose on it, right? Oh, yeah. Hold on. Let me see if I can find it. For, for the for the record here, this is Darren's what Rosebud or Waterloo or something. This is by the end. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what it was called. I didn't know what it was called, but I have it. <laughs> I like to find out whether people are fans or not. And for example, when I interviewed Chris Jericho, the wrestler who also sings for Fozzie and Axe and all that, he said after I asked that, he said, "I want to interview Dave just so I could find out what he was thinking." And he did that. <laughs> Now, I personally can listen to it and find a lot of enjoyment. Did you just listen to it once and then put it away? No, my move is if I have people over and like we're having a party and stuff, I put I put it on and then everyone goes like, yeah. And then it's like, what, what? And he's like, bueno, or whatever he does. <laughs> Como? <laughs> just, just to get the reaction, right? Yeah, and everyone's just like, what the hell is this? And then, and then they can't believe the whole album was done that way. Because it's one thing to record like your hit song, but it's another thing to do the entire record that way. So yeah, I have it. I bought it for uh, three ninety nine at Go Boy Records. <laughs> <laughs> wow, on vinyl three ninety nine. Yeah, well, I've had it for a long time, and I think I think I bought it like when vinyl wasn't cool or something like that. So. Does it have the joke on the vinyl itself? Because on Eat 'Em and Smile, I have the I have it on vinyl. And it's kind of like the A side has the songs not listed, and then the B side has all of it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Oh. Yes, he is a fan. <laughs> Hardcore. <laughs> Both languages, that Dave. So good. Uh, D Darren's working on spreading the appreciation and and the notoriety of, of that Spanish album to anyone who will come on this podcast. And for good reason, because it is really cool. But yeah. either you totally know it or you just go, what? <laughs> yeah, but most people, I think, know it. One of my best friends is learning Spanish right now, so I should like play this for him. He would get to <laughs> See la vida. Uh, so is it, is it okay? I, I, you once told me a story, but I think I interrupted you way back then. Did you once hang out with Dave? And if, if you're like, we cannot talk about that? Yes. Well, we can talk about it, but, but I, have to, I have to leave out some uh, legal things. <laughs> like, it's a funnier story in person because I can tell you this, someone's name that's really funny and like whatever, but I'll, I'll have to edit it a little bit so I don't get put in jail. But, but basically, <laughs> I, I worked at a... Um, a telemarketing job. My first job when I moved to LA in 1994, I was 21 years old and uh, I got a job at a uh, telemarketing place, which is where everyone worked when you first moved to LA. 
And it was pretty funny because I grew up on hair metal and like a lot of the guys that were in bands that I loved were also working at this job because it was 94 and they like hair metal was over. So I was selling like long distance uh, products, like a AT&T type of thing. And so like if I would uh, get a sale, I had to snap my finger and this other guy would come over with a, a tape recorder to verify the sale. So they had to like record the person saying they were gonna switch their long distance. But literally I would snap my fingers and then like the guy from Rock's Gang would come over and he'd hop on the phone and go like, you know, hey, I'm just hopping on to a verify the sale. And then, and then I would snap my finger and the guy from like Seduce or something would come over. You know, it's just like all these bands that like I saw in like Decline of the Western Civilization, they're all like sitting next to you know, my telemarketing job. And I'm just like, whoa, this is so cool. <laughs> so anyway. The manager at this place, uh, he, I'm trying to say how I could say this, he sold amusement uh, pharmaceuticals. <laughs> and so he, he would get us into um, all the strip clubs and stuff because that's basically where his office was. So we would do our telemarketing and then afterwards we would go to Crazy Girls, which is a, a strip club that's on La Brea. And Lemmy would be there in his little Daisy Duke shooting pool and, uh, and with his little, little butt hanging out. And then, and then David Lee Roth was always hanging out with my manager at the <laughs> telemarketing job because, of course, he gets the free, what did I call them? Entertainment, entertainment enhancers or something. Yeah, pharmaceuticals. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so a lot of times I would be sitting in a booth at Crazy Girls and someone would come in to do a business transaction and the person and my manager would go into the bathroom and I would be sitting in, at the booth with David Lee Roth, just me and him. But I, I had just went to LA and I learned that you're not supposed to do the, oh my God, you know, da, 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 da. So I was just trying to be cool and not acknowledge that this guy was, you know, total rock God, my, my hero or whatever. So, so I would just make small talk with him and just, just talk about random stuff. And of course he never made any sense at all. He's like, <laughs> you, know, you would say something to him and he'd be like, uh, yeah, it's kind of like when you're on the airplane and then the, you know, it, it starts to dive down and you grab the little, the little inflatable from under the chair and you're like, hold on, it's time for a ride. You know, it's like, you, you just say like stuff like that and you're just like, wait, what, what are you talking about? But <laughs> he literally is like that cartoon character guy or whatever. But um, so anyway, yeah. So I had a lot of, moments and I was in a I was in a band a long time ago called size 14 which Darren you're familiar with big fan and I, wrote, I wrote a song called old Van Halen and and the chorus was it was like a, you make me feel like I feel when I'm listening to old Van Halen or something like that and that was the chorus and then nerve herder came out with their song Van Halen which I'm in nerve herder now so that's funny but but uh, so I'm like, oh, man, I got to change the lyrics. So that ended up being the song called Let's Rob a Bank. That was on the first album. But originally, that song was called Old Ben Halen. So when I was sitting next to David Lee Roth, I just go, hey, man, you probably don't want to hear this. But I play in a band, and we wrote a song, like, in tribute to you. And it's called Old Van Halen. And he's like, ah, man, that's great. You know, Bozzy, Bozzy, Bop, or whatever. And he's like, <laughs> and he, he, goes, uh, he goes, just remember, if it's a hit song, I like expensive cars, fancy. He starts like listing stuff that I needed to buy him when when <laughs> when, the song, when the song became a hit, and then that was that was the only time we talked music. But I spent many many a night just sitting there trying to make idle conversation with David Lee Roth and not acknowledge that he was David Lee Roth. <laughs> wow, uh, the closest I can come to that is is in. For some reason, I was once interviewing the bassist of the Verve Pipe. And for some reason, they were talking about how their fleeting moment of fame at one point in time was they were in some club in L.A. And David Lee Roth sees them, goes, those are the guys who are in The Tonight Show. I'm going to buy them bottles of wine. And at first, Brian Vander Ark, the singer, who's still doing really, really well these days, was with his brother Brad, who's in the band. And at first, like, wow, David Lee Roth wants to hang out with us. And there, after an hour, they're like, wow, does he stop? Does he, does he stop talking? Your, <laughs> your story is a little different on that set. It doesn't sound like he talked your ear off because that's what you usually hear about Dave in the best of ways. Yeah, well, we were at a strip club where it was very loud. So talking was like, you know, you kind of have to like lean over and get in someone's ear or whatever. But we, you know, we still made, made chit chat for sure. But, but, you know, I was like, uh, you know, 
like, I don't know if you've ever seen like the size 14 video of Claire Danes poster, but I was 21, but I, I looked like I was probably like 16 or something. So, and you know, he was already like wearing a trench coat and looking like someone on to catch a predator or something. So he, 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 he probably thought like, Oh, this is like, who is this little kid that got in the strip club? <laughs> That, that's great. So bringing back to you and your glory, though, uh, do you have a favorite Dave solo album or even track? Um, wow, that's a good question. I really, I really like Skyscraper a lot. I saw that tour, and I love the band, obviously, um, on that record. Um, I'm trying to think, like, I guess, I guess either Skyscraper or Eat 'Em and Smile. I mean, those are the two big ones, but those are also the, the greatest ones, in my opinion. I didn't know if you were going to troll and talk about uh, your filthy little mouth being your favorite because that has all the good deep cuts. Steve, right. I could see you doing that. <laughs> no, I'm always the guy. I'm always the guy that likes the most commercial stuff. Like, you know, if someone's talking about yes, I'm always like talking about nine zero one two five, and they get mad at me. And then same if here. Someone, <laughs> if someone's talking about Chicago, I'm like, oh, I love Chicago. Like, I only love stuff after seventeen, and everyone's just like, well, are you kidding me? Like, I, I always like the poppiest stuff from any any cool band. <laughs> so does that mean that in a way, because going back to what I was saying with your shredding, that sometimes you have to tone it down the technicality of what you're doing to kind of meet the project. Um. Well, I definitely remember when I first moved to LA, it wasn't cool to shred at all. So like there was a bunch of people who were really great musicians who were pretending like they didn't know how to play guitar. I mean, this is like <laughs> you know, when, when like Pavement and all those bands came out, we were all like, oh, this is cool. There's no way we can like play a solo. So I like I purposely when I was writing those original Size 14 songs, like was trying to come up with chords and stuff that were kind of wrong and dissonant and didn't sound really good. And I would never shred a solo um for sure and I, I remember going to see nuno betancourt's band he had this band called population zero in the mm -hmm. mid 90s and they were playing at some small club on melrose and so i so i, I talked my friend into going and i'm like man you got to hear this guy play guitar he's like unreal and he didn't play like a solo the whole night because <laughs> like, you know it wasn't, it wasn't cool to play like that anymore i mean he was playing some stuff but it was not like uh extreme kind of stuff well, you, so, solved, uh, you solved a mystery for me because I envisioned that whole post uh, hair metal era, early 90s, early and mid 90s bit is just the Sunset Strip being filled with these morose, long haired guys going, what the hell do we do now? We can't give guitar lessons, but now I know they're doing telemarketing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I, I actually had that same experience when grunge took over. I was, I was one of those guys just going like, oh my God, how do I, like, I don't connect with this music at all. There's no... There's no showmanship. Everyone's just dressed like the football player. And they're just like, you know, like staring at their shoes. And, and then the music was not hooky. It was just very like jammy and all that kind of stuff. And then I remember when, uh, when I first went to LA, this is 94, as I keep saying, uh, Weezer Blue Album came out and Green Day Dookie. And those two albums, I was like, oh, I can do this. This is like fun. Great songs. Yeah, power chords through a Marshall. Weezer even threw in some guitar solos. So I was just like, okay, I'm on board with this. And then I kind of just went into kind of pop punk Weezer-y land. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that that's was kind of my time too. Although also at that time, I was also, you know, lamenting the fact that so many of those bands were still putting out great music, but nobody gave a damn or, you know, you know nobody cared about uh you know a band that had a hit record in 88 a platinum record can barely not even go gold in 94 with whatever it might be but i was i was like there i still want to hear current music i want to hear new music from these guys they're still creating yeah. they're still well, doing good and stuff also, there was there were some bands that came out right at the end too that i wish had more time like there was a band called love hate that like oh, oh that god album. yes was so great and even some of like like spread eagle i know you know spread eagle and like vein and there were just all these bands that kind of came out like in the early 90s and they really only had like a year before everything like hit the fan and, and it just would have been nice to hear another three or four records that were produced really well because a lot of those bands did make records after grunge but they lost their recording budget so the production on them is usually really terrible even if the songs yeah. did um so it, that was kind of a bummer but there are there are some bands still like like la gun sounds amazing like their new stuff sounds so good and i saw them play live they sound amazing I, I love it when there's a band from that era that's still able to put out a new record that sounds good and is up to the standard and like you can go see live and they still look great and they, they definitely held it together 
Yeah, I had the pleasure of seeing LA Guns a year and a half ago when I was in Oklahoma of all places. Still great. When did it become okay for you personally to be outward though with all these bands that you like? In other words, when did it go from I love Van Halen too in 1984 and Roth and all that to I don't to it's cool again? Late 90s? Well, I, I never didn't like them. The, the thing is, it's like uh, I was trying to sort of um, adapt to the new musical climate. So I didn't want to have this band that came out doing the stuff that no one was interested in anymore. So I had to find music that I could relate to, but that was current. And that was the Weezer Green Day thing for me. Um, but, but even in size 14 days, that was kind of our goof is like, we would play in between songs. We would break into like, it's not love by Dokken or like <laughs> we, we always acknowledge the, the metal thing. And, um, we, we, I don't think there was ever a time it, that I would pretend that I wasn't a metalhead Cause like, it's such a, you know, that was such a huge part of my musical growth and my brain is still filled with encyclopedic knowledge from that era. Like I can't, I can't remember like what I did last week, but if you tell me what's song three on side two of, you know, Bang Tango's second album or something, I could probably tell you. <laughs> That's some deep knowledge there, man. I, I can, I can do a uh, bits and pieces of that as well for some, some bands of that, <clears throat> of that era that I just loved and, you know, would still raising the flag, like, you, you know, they're still out there. They're still current. They're still making good music and they didn't necessarily try to go the grunge route. Although a lot of those guys did let's tune yeah. down and wear flannel, you know, but. There's a lot of records that came out during that time though, that, that I can still listen to now and they still sound really cool. They're, you know what I mean? There's like, there, there's some, it's like anything. It's like any music, you know, how 80, 80s music sometimes had that really ridiculous snare drum that had all the reverb on it. And, and some of the metal bands like got a little silly with the squealy guitar solos and stuff, but the songs are really great still and the production is still good and it's organic and it's people who are like you know the the talent back then was so amazing everyone was a virtuoso and a great singer and you know even yeah. like the most, even the most average hair metal band is probably 10 times better than <laughs> than any rock band today you know and it seems yeah. like a lot of the artists that you've subsequently worked with and have become friends with like parry from nerf herder and jared from bowling for soup it seems like they grew up on the same records that you did Totally, yeah. That was a big bonding uh, experience for Jarrett and I because we're roughly the same age and we, we loved all the same bands. And, uh, he did he had the opposite trajectory. I, I started out listening to the really heavy stuff like Merciful Fate and Slayer and, and all that stuff. And then when I realized that girls like Bon Jovi and like <laughs> melodic music, that's when I started going like, oh, I need to learn how to write songs. He did the opposite. He started with the cheesy stuff and then got got into the really heavy stuff later later as a teenager. But Everyone has their own path. <laughs> <laughs> and for you personally, because I'll promote it a little bit in the intro, but what are you working on in the moment? Because you've been beyond generous with sharing your shred history and your DLR story. <laughs> um, currently, I have a I have an electronic pop project called Able Machines. That's sort of the new thing I'm, I'm working on now. Um, it's with a, a, a female singer named Tay Collier. And we have two singles out. We're working on an EP right now. And it's very like uh, another facet of my musical fandom is I love Swedish and Norwegian uh, pop music, um, starting with ABBA and then the Cardigans. But also there's this whole new wave of Scandinavian pop uh, that I really love. So this kind of is in line with that, just like electronic pop, just total, you know, commercial pop songs. Um, so I have that. And uh, I'm actually working on a rock record while we're while we're talking about rock, that's something that would appeal to fans of my more rock stuff, like Size 14 and Nerf Herder and Bowling for Soup and all that kind of stuff. So, We we should point people to a really cool interview I read of yours uh, at medium.com uh, oh, from, from back, I think it was like um, April or so. And uh, you, it's I learned about that, uh, the new stuff you're doing, and uh, it was uh, your rock bona fides. And, and, uh, but I would, uh, if anybody's curious, it's a great interview you did. I learned a lot. And, um, I, and uh, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you over the fact that, you know, we're, as I am also a huge power pop fan, you name check a bunch of folks there like Mike Viola, who I absolutely love. And yes. um, uh, I think, and I know you've worked with Roger Manning and, and folks like that. So, I mean, just kudos because that's the stuff that just, keep you know i'm constantly scouring the interwebs for various 
um, you know, power pop sites and recommendations and Facebook groups and all that stuff. So totally. Yeah. That's like what my solo stuff is. I mean, yeah, I guess it's, it's, I, I've been doing this so long that I suppose my discography is kind of confusing at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what does this guy do? He worked for Puff Daddy and he shredded with Paul Gilbert and he played with the jellyfish guys. And like, I, I just, I just love music. I love like all different kinds of music and I love having different projects that fit into these little, compartments and getting to explore explore that so um, hey, vers versatility is great and uh you know it doesn't put you in one 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 box as i'm sure as far as uh you know artistic employment opportunities yeah it, keep, it keeps me entertained i think i'd go crazy if i was only doing one thing but but sometimes from a uh business perspective you know you wonder like oh if i would have just focused on this one thing instead of trying to do 50 different things would i have you know gone in a different path but but i'm I'm pretty happy where I'm at. <laughs> and then, of course, there's the projects like scoring School of Rock. Uh, yeah. Forget about that. That's also in a totally different direction. Is scoring something that you hope to do more of in the future once COVID makes productions kind of happen again? Yeah. Uh, to be honest with you, um, that's a big part of my income right now. And it really hasn't slowed down that much. I've been doing a lot of, I do a lot of kids commercials. Um, so I've been doing a ton of those recently. And I'm still getting opportunities from uh, Disney and Nickelodeon. I, I wrote a couple songs for one of their upcoming shows on Disney um, called The Curse of Molly McGee and uh, they just they are having me pitch for another show so um, that stuff is still going and it hasn't really slowed down. It's not it's not anything that has been affected hugely by the the COVID thing. Um, as far as scoring goes I, I, do, I do scoring but I my whole thing is like I never really look at music as being background like in the background so like my dream job would be to get like a Josie and the Pussycats type of cartoon where like the songs are the feature you know what I mean so mm -hmm. it's like pop songs pop songs that are like featured in in the cartoon because so, sometimes it's like you slave over this like piece of music or something and then you finally see the show or the cartoon and it's like you can barely even hear it and you know like you go through all this like back and forth trying to get the song perfect and then and then you can hardly even hear it because it's behind all this dialogue. <laughs> well, so, I think so we need a new seeing... cartoon. Oh, sorry. Well, uh, after I ask this, the floor is yours, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> the telemarketing thing you were saying before where you ran in, into a lot of 80s people there randomly, any of those folks around the commercial world at all? Um... Let me think about that. Uh, I, there was a guy. There was a guy I knew named Jeff. Uh, no one, no one that you know, but he's sort of gone on on to do commercials and stuff like that. Um, why are you trying to get me to say like Mark Ferrari or something like? <laughs> Mark Ferrari. Mark Slaughter doing voiceovers on Tiny Tunes or whatever. No. Uh, raise your hand. Raise your hand if you know Mark Ferrari was the lead guitarist in Keel. Of course. That's, 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 how I, that's how I knew him to begin with. But he turned into like this gnarly like music library guy. He like sold his catalog for millions of dollars. And he's like, he's, yeah, he's you, he came out on the other side. <laughs> yeah, Darren, you met, you mentioned, uh, you just mentioned uh, Mark Slaughter. I was just thinking I read somewhere or le learned somehow a while back that Fred Corey of Cinderella fame does, I think, scores TV shows maybe. I yeah, can't yeah, remember yeah. exactly. He does, yeah, yeah. I follow him on Twitter, and he like he sc scores some like show on ABC or something like that. So yeah, he's doing good. There's lots and lots of those. Like um, Greg Jufra, is that his name from the band Jufra? Jufria. Jufria. Greg Jufria, yeah. formerly of Angel. That's before right. that, and House of Lords he invented some like musical chip that goes into slot machines that was patented. So I think he gets a tiny royalty off of each. Oh slot my machine. god. Something ridiculous like that. There's for every like really sad story, uh, for for every Stephen Piercy inventing Mike Knuckles, there is a better story. <laughs> oh man, yeah. Now that I've taken the spotlight away, back to you, Steve. <laughs> no, I was no, I, I was just gonna say when you mentioned cartoons, I think the time is right for a for a cartoon of about a cartoon of an imaginary band that may or may not go about solving mysteries or doing something completely different. A multicultural power pop cartoon yep. band, right? Yeah, um, it would it would be nice if they did a cartoon and let because what happens now a lot of times when you get hired to do a cartoon, they they have all these people that have already decided exactly what everything is supposed to sound like. And they'll give you these references like, this needs to sound like Shake It Off by Taylor Swift or da 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 
And so basically at that point, it just turns into McDonald's because you're trying to just give them what they want to make them happy, but you're not using any of your own internal, what would make this good? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I, I wish they would do a show like that and hire someone amazing. It would be nice if it was me, but even if it was just <laughs> someone else, that was great. And just go like, what do you think would be cool? Because if you gave someone, you know, some space to really create something, like it could be next level amazing. But but they kind of, they focus group everything to death. So, so there's not, there's, there's not often a lot of time for originality. Like, like if there was a show where like, the song sounded like jellyfish or something and everything was this epic like queen kind of thing and that would be so amazing and kids love queen like that whole the whole resurgence of queen and all that stuff that's happening now and um i don't know i just think it'd be great they got they gotta they gotta they gotta do that not try and make everything sound like the same thing all the time not to turn it into a whole brainstorming cartoon session but i just had the light bulb go off where and i gotta i gotta say because uh, just in 20 seconds i thought hmm that might not be a bad idea, but take a cartoon of an imaginary hard rock band, right? But it's got to look like and also have that very adult sensibility uh, and uh, just hilariousness, if you can match that, of Archer. Totally, totally. Right? Yeah. It, it, it doesn't even have to be for kids at all. It should just be exactly. for adults that remember that era or whatever. It could be so funny, but the songs could be really good. And I mean, you, you, you could probably actually get all the dudes that did it the first time to play on all the songs. and <laughs> Right. I mean, I, I look at the Archer character and sometimes I think, you know, he kind of does have lead singer disease when you think about it, right? <laughs> yeah. Totally, totally. No, that's a great idea. Let's pitch it. <laughs> all right. Well, we got it here. So, you know, I'm not yeah. looking for much. <laughs> make, sure you, make sure you delete this part from the podcast so no one steals our idea. <laughs> they have to do that. But the bottom line is, Linus, you very generous with your time as always. We're going to send everyone to the website, keep up the greatness. And uh, I don't know, as, as Roth would say, nothing but yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys for having me. Uh, I don't know if we filled our quota with David Lee Roth material, but uh, hopefully I didn't say anything uh, too disparaging. I, I, love, I love David Lee Roth. I'm a fan. So if, if somehow he sees this, I love you. <laughs> <laughs>